So, welcome back. Let us continue our study of stochastic local search algorithms. Uh, remember that we arrived at this place because of the fact that our search spaces can be humongous and the simpler approaches that we saw uh, may not always succeed essentially. And we also saw that we, since we came to hill climbing and then moved on to simulated annealing that we have converted the problem into an optimization problem. And today we want to look at a population based method which is very popular in the optimization community. And this is a method which has taken inspiration from nature because nature has also one can say embarked upon a journey of improving uh, life forms. So, we know that different species evolve continuously and we want to take motivation from that. So, let us start with some basic questions. So, the kind of questions we want to ask is what is life? Essentially, if you look around you find all forms of life coexisting and we are but one example of such a life form. So, what is life? How did it come about? What is the goal of life if any and so on? So, these are some of the questions that we want to very briefly look at. Why do we have different life forms? Essentially, no? So, you have millions of species not to speak of the individuals which belong to each of those species. Is evolution a kind of a design process? Is nature doing some kind of experimentation to see which are the life forms which are good whatever good means here. Is nature looking for a perfect design essentially, but the question that arises is if yes then what is the purpose of designing these life forms? Why do we have life in the first place? How come we have life in the first place? And secondly why do we have so many different life forms and what is going on in the world essentially. So, let us start with this question what is life and I will draw your attention to the fact that over the last 15, 20 years or maybe a bit more uh, people have been in, involved in creating what they call as artificial life. So, basically artificial life is something which kind of mimics or looks like natural life except that it exists inside your computers or on your screens and so on. And in many ways they tend to behave like normal life forms. So, in many countries in the world artificial pets became very popular. Uh, many years ago and uh, so much so that for example, people would get attached to their uh, artificial pets and you know rush back home from office saying that I want to feed my I have to feed my pet and so on essentially. So, one of the earliest people who was involved in this was this British computer scientist called Steve Grant and he wrote this book on artificial life and creatures. So, creatures is a name that one gives to these artificial uh, life forms that uh, populate your screens essentially. So, the book is called creation uh, with the subtitle or subtext that life and how to make it. So, Steve Plan very profoundly observed that he has uncovered what he calls as the most important law of nature and the law is this that things that persist, persist, things that do not, do not. Now, if you were to go through his book, this book creation, I think around page 40 or 39 or 40 or something, you will see an explanation of this law as he calls it, things that persist, persist, things that do not, do not. Now, on the surface of it, it looks like a tautology 
like obviously things which pers persist will persist and obviously things that do not, do not. But if you think a little bit carefully about what he is saying, you can see that this is the genesis of, of life forms because life is a form of persistence. Essentially. So, let us take that up. Uh, he says things that persist, persist. And he goes on to say that what we see as persisting, for example, you see clouds on a hilltop, ripples in a pond or even human bodies. I mean human bodies are collections of large collections of atoms which somehow stick together and persist in the form of a human body. He says that in some way a persistent impression that all these things that clouds on a hilltop. So, for example, in his book he describes that if you were to go on a hilltop where you see a cloud which seems to be hanging on top of the hilltop, when you go there you will see that there is a tremendous amount of breeze there. So, it is not as if the cloud is physically stationary on the hilltop, the breeze is kind of flowing over the hill, but as the moisture rises to the top of the hill it condenses and as it moves on it uh, loses its uh, condensed form and what we see is a cloud which is stationary on top of the hill whereas what really happens is that there is a lot of moist air blowing over the hill and some of it temporarily appears like a stationary cloud. The cloud itself appears stationary but the wind is moving. There is a similar phenomena in ripples in a pond. You see ripples, uh, it appears that the ripples are moving, but the water is not really moving. It is a wave of energy which is moving. And he says that even human bodies are like that, that the impression they, that, that what you call a human body is a persistent impression of a constantly changing landscape. So, he says that our own bodies are made up of atoms that are entirely different from when you were a child. Now, obviously, you know that human bodies uh, grow out of uh, a single cell level egg being fertilized by a sperm and then out of that egg and sperm, the union of that, the whole body grows. Essentially. So, obviously, our bodies are made up of atoms and atoms keep changing. So, the example that uh, uh, one gives is that the atoms in our bodies keep changing, but somehow the notion of our body, the notion of our self, the no no notion of a person is persistent essentially. And uh, so, what persists is this notion, not the physical bodies, uh, physical atoms that make part of the bodies. Now, inanimate matter has a natural persistence, for example, rocks and water and so on, they just exist and they continue to exist and so on. But life forms, because they are more structured, they are more complex, uh, have a different form of persistence, which includes, for example, the growth of the bodies, all animals, all trees, all plants, all humans, everything grows. And all life forms, one can in fact say that you can distinguish life forms from inanimate matter by the process that they procreate and create copies of themselves and you know therefore propagate the species and so on. Now, plants and animals they grow by consuming food in some form or the other and this food is used both for adding matter to their bodies in the sense their bodies grow and also for energy for any activity that they do. So, if you see a dog running around in your garden, the energy that it needs for doing that comes from the food that it eats and likewise for all life forms. Now, the question is why do we have so many different kind of life forms? Now, the act of procreation makes similar copies. So, dogs produce baby dogs, deer produce baby deer, human produce baby humans and so on and so forth. In some sense, we pass on the design of our bodies 
and in the process we define the species that we belong to. So, the species exists as a concept, as a class, as a group of individuals which kind of propagates itself, but it is the individuals in the species that consume resources. So, each, each physical entity whether it is a dog or a cat or a deer or a mouse, they consume uh, energy to sustain themselves to survive and so on, but the resources that they consume are limited. So, this introduces competition for the same resources and we know that Charles Darwin introduced this notion of survival of the fittest and so what we can understand from that is that there is competition amongst individuals uh, for resources, the individuals comes from different species and whichever species has a better design to go ahead in this competition that species does better in this world essentially. So, competition is at one level between the species that species compete for the same resources. For example, lions and hyenas may compete for some deer in a forest, but it is not just between the species that competition exists, more interestingly for us because that is the basis of evolution, there is competition within the species as well. So, for example, the individuals in a species compete for many things. The fastest of the wildest foxes gets the rabbit and the fastest of the cleverest rabbits escape. I mean this is just an example that I am giving here, but essentially that within the species the fitter ones in some sense survive and the unfit ones may not survive essentially. Why is that important? Because the ones that survive are the ones which get to propagate their genes and in that sense it is the genes of the individuals that survive that get propagated more than the genes of individuals which do not survive. And in this way the nature kind of you know tries to continuously improve upon the design of each species essentially. So, it is not as if the species is constant, uh, we keep evolving all the time essentially. I mean, so species evolve continuously because you know as I said the fastest foxes will get to propagate and the fastest rabbits will survive and get to propagate. So, it is like a design of a life form and nature has evolved a process of creative adaptation. How does one improve upon one's design? So, what nature does is a kind of a search in uh, a population of candidates and it has this novel mechanism of sexual reproduction which allows inheritance of genes from two parents. So, every child in most forms of nature, of course, there are some, some, some forms of nature where there is cloning, but typically those are very simple life forms and they do not evolve too much. But in all other life forms, uh, it is always that we combine the genes from two parents to produce a child and that child goes through a process of competition and the ones that survive are the ones who will propagate the genes further. So, that is the process of trial and error search that nature has adapted. Uh, this is called survival of the fittest or by natural selection. So, the French poet Valerie said very creatively that it takes two to invent anything. The one makes up combinations and the other chooses. So, what he is saying here is that evolution or improvement of a design is not a process in which there is only one kind of activity going on, but in a sense that there is one aspect to it in which you try to improve upon designs and there is another aspect of it which judges upon the new designs and says ok this one is better or this one is not as good and so on and so forth. So, in nature the two forces that he is talking about are essentially uh, 
the mixing of, mixing up of genes is what makes up the combinations. This is done through sexual reproduction as we just mentioned. And the other chooses and the other is in some sense nature itself. And I mean, we do not want to think of nature as an entity or as a, as a designer or as, as something which is a, a conscious entity which is, you know, doing the world. Uh, but rather that the process of persistence which Steve Grant outlined that whatever persists, persists and whatever does not, does not creates this process of selection because it is only that which persists which can compete for the resources and so on obviously. So, you can think of this as an instance of generate and test uh, in the sense that nature is producing new designs and testing them out in the real world to see if they survive or not. Now, if you look at the biological aspect of things, uh, we can distinguish between two ways of describing the same entity. One is called the genotype, which is the set of genes in the DNA responsible for a particular trait. So, for example, you know people might say that uh, you have genes for uh, black eyes or you have genes for blue eyes and things like that. So, traits that we often look for in human beings uh, can be traced back to some genetic makeup of the individual and the total genetic makeup of the individual which is expressed in the genome of the individual is known as the genotype. The organisms, organisms phenotype is the physical entity or physical expression of those genes. It is the actual physical creature which the genes have resulted in or expressed themselves in the form essentially. So, if you look at these two things then the mixing up of genes takes place uh, at the genotype level and the competition happens at the phenotype level because it is the individual which goes out in the world and fights to survive essentially. Sexual reproduction which results in the mixing of genes does not happen randomly in nature. It is not that you just arbitrarily take two individuals and uh, you know they produce their offspring. In nature, individuals actively choose mates essentially and in fact, the competition that we are talking about is not just for resources like food and energy, it is also for mates and this is within the species that in some sense we are designed to look for mates which we find attractive and the whole notion of attractiveness is such that we are attracted towards members of the opposite sex who we innately feel or in intuitively feel or subconsciously feel will result in better offspring essentially. So, all life forms have evolved ways to attract the opposite sex. For example, in the birds, uh, you often see that the male are almost always or almost always most colorful and they have to go through an elaborate process of trying to attract uh, uh, the female of the species. And it is the male who for example, often goes and constructs a uh, nest and tries to invite a um, female to come and occupy that nest or it is a male peacock for example, uh, which does the song and dance show which is designed to attract the female. So, it is an active process, the selection of mates is an active process and amongst humans of course, it is much more complex. In fact, there are people who say that uh, uh, the human brain uh, evolved not so much to compete with other species, but to compete within the species that you know humans try to impress the opposite sex by showing their mental proudness, by showing that they are good at music or art or dance or whatever the case may be. And 
some people speculate that that we have developed these huge brains simply to be able to attract more uh, healthier mates essentially. So, health, wealth and cleverness are all part of the mating game in humans essentially. Now, if you look at the world, there is competition going on uh, between various species, but at the same time we have an ecosystem uh, which kind of exists in a quasi stationary form uh, in which each species is uh, evolving. So, like we said uh, the, the fox which is dependent upon the rabbit for food, let us assume for simplicity that, fo that foxes eat only rabbits and squirrels, that the population of foxes will be dependent on the population of rabbits. So, what this diagram kind of shows is the positive influence of one population on another. So, if there are more rabbits, then they will sus support more foxes and therefore, the, the number of foxes will increase. So, the population of rabbits has a positive influence on the population of foxes. The population of foxes in turn may have a positive influence on the population of lions and so on and so forth. So, so nature exists in, 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 in a fairly stable ecosystem, but nowadays of course, people have started worrying about whether it is going to be so stable after all because uh, of the fact that human activity seems to have overtaken everybody else's activity and you know one hears constant stories about one species dying out here or another species dying out here, the shortage of sparrows in, in cities and all kinds of things and there is a fear that uh, uh, the collapse of some species may result in a catastrophic event in which a whole subset of this ecosystem will just get destroyed essentially. So, for example, if there are no butterflies or bees to pollinate flowers, then flowers will not survive and you know there could be a chain reaction that kind of a thing. So, going back to what Valerie said, it takes two to invent anything, the one makes up combinations, the other chooses and the other chooses what is important to him in the mass of things which the former has imparted to him. So, the other will choose not based on a total evaluation of the former in the sense that it is like a designer offering many different choices to a customer let us say. The customer will choose uh, based on what the customer's own preferences are essentially. Now, in nature and we have already said that this happens through a process of uh, mixing and matching of genes and, and survival of the individuals which are expressions of those genes. So, the process of sexual reproduction experiments with the genotype by making up different combinations of the genes inherited by the two parents. So, even if we take a pair of siblings or hum pair of human siblings, you see often that they are very different from each other unless of course, they happen to be identical twins in which case very often they are very similar and almost indistinguishable. But for most siblings, they have they are different from each other. How how does that difference come? This difference comes because each child has inherited a different set of combination of genes from the parent, and therefore each child is different in that sense. Of course, we know that the human species is more than ninety nine percent similar. That all of us have identical genes, which are more than ninety nine percent same. It is just that a small thing here and there makes a difference between different individuals and that small thing is what eventually counts into resulting in different kinds of individuals which go and compete in the real world. So, we said that the process of competition for survival of the phenotype in the real world selects the best candidates and then their genes propagate essentially. So, this is nature's way of going about it, mix up genes, let the phenotype out in the world and let it fight for survival and those which survive will propagate their genes further. So, genetic algorithms is a branch of optimization which kind of takes motivation from nature uh, 
genetic algorithms were devised by John Holland in the University of Michigan in 1975 or so and was popularized by his student uh, David Goldberg in his book uh, called Genetic Algorithms. So, it is a class of optimization methods. Uh, opti optimization methods for optimization problems more generally known as evolutionary algorithms. So, if you talk about evolutionary algorithms, one of the way that things can evolve is through uh, this genetic algorithm which involves a mixing up of genes and then looking at things. So, these are he heuristic stochastic adaptive search algorithms. They are heuristic in the sense that you know they are driven by the fitness function, they are stochastic because there is random mating as we will see and they are adaptive because you know as they you go along uh, the population keeps changing. It is implemented in a population of candidates. So, remember that we are searching in the solution space and only thing now is that we are working with the population of candidates and these candidates exist in the solution space. Instead of working with one candidate, we are working with a population. It is inspired by the process of natural selection as we have just said and what we do in genetic algorithms is that we impose a fitness function which evaluates each candidate. Now, in nature fitness is in fact defined by survivability that in some sense whatever survives is fit, but in genetic algorithms we turn this upside down, we impose an external fitness function and then we make sure that the fit candidates they get to propagate more essentially. Hmm? Because our goal is to optimize some function which is sometimes called the objective function or the evaluation function or the heuristic function in our case or the fitness function in the case of genetic algorithm and we want to maximize the value of that. Nature's goal we can hypothesize is persistence and therefore, it defines fitness in terms of persistence. The fittest candidates get to meet and to reproduce. So, given a population of candidate solutions, the genetic algorithm has a, is a three stage process. Uh, first, there is the stage of reproduction. Unlike in nature, reproduction is done by cloning that you make copies of each candidate and you make as many copies as the candidate is fit. So, fit candidates get more than one copy, unfit candidates may simply die out essentially. So, you maintain a population of let us say n candidates, you start off with n candidates, the first step is reproduction in which you make copies uh, or you can say you clone them essentially. The second step is the mixing up of genes and in the context of genetic algorithms, we call this as a crossover operation. And what we do in crossover is that we randomly mate the resulting population that is obtained by cloning and then we mix up the genes. We will see the crossover operation in a moment. The third stage is also kind of inspired by nature and this is mutation which says that once in a while change some gene in some individual. Uh, and this happens in nature that you know suddenly some gene goes mutation, uh, go, goes through a process of mutation. And the goal of introducing that in, in genetic algorithms as we will see in an example uh, is to make sure that, that if sometimes a gene has been lost, maybe it can be regained through a process of mutation. Or sometimes when a mutation happens, then it becomes beneficial for a uh, individual and then it starts propagating and so on. So, the cross the, the crossover operators that we are talking about uh, are simply saying that uh, you take up the genes of two parents. So, remember that we have we first produced uh, uh, in the reproduction phase a uh, set of clones, then we randomly picked two parents. So, let them be uh, parent 1 and parent 2 and let x1 up to x8 and y1 into y8 be the genes of those that parent. Then in something a process of, of, of mixing up genes, one simple approach is uh, simply says that you take half the genes, not half, you choose a random uh, crossover point here and then take one side into one child 
and the other side into the other child and likewise for the other two, two parents. So, this kind of a crossover is called as a single point crossover. There is no sanctity about this, it is just that it is easy to implement and very often we try something like single point crossover and you could do it for example, for the SAT uh, problem. Remember that a candidate in SAT is a sequence of bits. As I said, single point does not have any sanctity and below you can see that there are other ways of mixing up genes. For example, you take alternate genes from alternate parents and you could get another way of producing the children. So, this is the genetic algorithm at a high level. We start with the initial population of candidates and we calculate the fitness of each member selected. Then we produce a new population by a process of uh, cloning which is in proportion to the fitness of each candidate. Then this selected population we partition into two halves and randomly mate them and apply the crossover function that we have to the members of this thing and we produce a new population called offspring. Then with a low probability make some members of the offspring, mutate some members of the offspring so that you know you may do this and this is typically done very rarely. Then for the original population which is P 1 to N we replace their k weakest members of this with the k strongest me members of the offspring. Of course, some variations of this they replace the entire population. So, the entire population p 1 to n is replaced by the entire set of offspring 1 to n, but this desire to keep a few very good ones sometimes helps in some problems and people just try this out experimentally. And we just repeat this process. Uh, under till some termination criteria that either some kind of a stability has been achieved or we uh, according to the computation resources that we have and then we return the best member from this. Okay, so, in the next uh, video we will look at an example uh, a little bit more detailed example and look at this notion of crossover and uh, survival of genes and this thing. And then we will move on to trying to look at how t the TSP problem, the traveling salesman problem can be solved using GAs, which is quite an interesting appli application. So, see you uh, in the next session.